your front door bandana on a face 50 thou on your dome you ain't ready for the sound coming out to the skull Loud for the buckshot weapons in the waistband finger on the trigger with the scout what is up Raven, Raven voices. voices. See, see me here, back, back again. again. I, don't I don't have the amazing, amazing Halle Berry. Berry. Rumor, Rumor has it he's getting, getting ready for something very special in just, in just a moment. moment. I'll, I'll let him do that. that. Um, but but I, I actually, actually want, want to introduce you to a very, very special staff member who is going to be taking you into the next part of the festival. This, this year, we kind of fused a couple of roles together, together and, and came out with an education coordinator. coordinator. This, this person is responsible for not only organizing some of the workshops, but, but the educational offerings that are particularly designed for educators, educators and, and some youth that they choose, choose to attend, but just to advance, advance our knowledge and just like further us as a community. And this person has done an amazing job creating spaces where we can sort of further our learning. And this next offering that this person is going to bring you it's all about how we can change and transform and develop in this virtual space and make it worthwhile for the youth i'm going to read what's on this phone and then i'm going to tell y'all what i really know about this person um pat mcgill is a trailblazer for poetic media and arts education her radical approach to social identity learning and to use the spoken word has forged her success as a national turn artist a speaker, a speaker and, also and also a program, program consultant for more, more than 10 years. years. During, During Pat's career as a performing poet, poet she shared the stage, stage with listen to this. Not, not only in the award winning Tom LaVanzant, but also New York Times bestseller Claudia Ramsey and Grammy, Grammy non nominated Oza Motley and, and the legendary Sonia Sanchez, just to name a few. Since founding and leading as the executive director of Say Word, her exec educational nonprofit, she's, she's also partnered with leading organizations like the NAACP, the Wallace Annenberg Foundation, Engaging the Census, and Peace Over Violence all over the world. And y'all, let me just tell you, working with Kat for the past couple of years, she is vibrant, she is candid, and she gets the work done because she truly believes in this work for the youth. Foremost, she's all about the youth. With, with no, no further ado, please, please welcome, welcome the leader of the Brave New Leader Session, Pat, Pat McGill. Before we get started, Sid, thank you for that introduction. Unfortunately, we couldn't understand any of it because uh, it was echoing really bad. Um, so I just want to make sure I, you guys can hear me. Um, so if you can, throw me some thumbs up, some hearts. Okay. Um, perfect, perfect. So um, I don't know all who's in here. So if you have not yet um, opened up the chat with that little green box, please do so because that's a great way um, that you can be able to communicate during this if you have any questions, anything like that. Also, um, there'll be a, a question and answer portion at the end um, that if you have any other questions and you want to wait to the end, you can um, click the little green box that will pop up and you can do that as well. Um, outside of that, uh, if you are here, let's just do a check-in. Um, I know I see Joel and I see Nicole. Is there any other brave new, le blah, 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 blah. Brave new leaders in this space? Uh, if so, uh, drop what organization that you're coming from in the chat um, and also your title. So I know who you are, what you do, all the things. So I'll give a second for that to happen uh, to see who else we have in the space right now um so again i see joel and i see nicole is there anybody else in here uh that's trying to get this good work i see cheryl henry salt lake city um i love that thank you so much cheryl i see leah hey leah so glad that you're here um anybody else in the space um i love shouting people out because you guys do incredible amazing work and it takes a lot and we shout out the kids all the time so shouting out yourself um is a good thing to get in the uh, habit of doing as well all right so um i'm gonna jump right in today before i go to the slideshow though i do want to say uh, my name is kat mcgill i'm your educational coordinator uh this year for brave new voices so all the workshops and panels um that your youth are experiencing 
I had the honor and privilege of putting together. Um, I also have been the executive director for a organization called Say Word in Los Angeles for 12 years. Uh, and we do youth development through poetry like many of you do through radical social identity learning. And I can talk a little bit about what that is. Um, I also am the founder and creator of Screen Time Slam, which is a digital platform. Uh, on Instagram for poets around the world uh, to compete that was started during the pandemic um, as well as a filmmaker and event producer. So I do a bunch of shit. Um, I am definitely a uh, you know, uh, multi potential lights, uh, which many executive directors are. Um, and I'm really excited to talk today about hybrid programming. Uh, we're moving into an era where digital and virtual programs are not going away. Um, and so learning how to fuse those together of uh, both your live pr programming when it returns, as well as sustaining virtual program that has a lot of benefits to partnerships, funding, uh, sponsorships, things like that, um, so that moving forward you um, have the tools necessary to create the most access for your neighborhoods, for where you serve. So uh, with that, we're going to jump right into the slideshow. So um, if Rachel, beautiful, I love it, I love it, I love it. So. The benefits of hybrid programming. Let me pull up my little square here so I can navigate us through this process. So um, I always like to start um, from the perspective of the youth uh, because we are about the youth and we put the youth first. So there was a survey done um, and this was the preferences uh, that were collected afterwards. And as you see, the red is not disagree, the red is actually somewhat agree. Um, and the majority of students, uh, when they were asked, uh, how do they see education moving forward? Um, many of them said, take some of my courses in a fully online format, uh, right? We have 46%. And then somewhat agree was 27%. Um, take some of my courses as a combination in person online. That's what we're talking a lot about today is that hybrid um, Have more technology use in my in my fully in-person courses, right learning what they have access to um, And then more digital materials and digital resources in my courses. You'll see the majority right is here um, that really desire that, right? And so if we're listening to our demographic, we're listening to those we serve, this is something they actually want, right? So then we go to the, um, the second part of the Digital Learning Pulse Survey. And this is, who's optimistic? How are they looking at the future? How are they looking at technology with education? And this again is from the student's perspective, right? You have 57 plus 27, right, who somewhat agree, um, that want to do online learning, right? 52% um, and 35% feel pretty comfortable with using digital materials. 48% and 40%, right, courses that combine in-person and online instruction. Um, and then exam proctoring, that's not something you have to worry about. But as you see, the amount of students that are not for this, that are more pessimistic, is way less than the amount of students that are for this. So when you're thinking about, you know, do we just drop all of our virtual stuff? It's too difficult. I don't know how to manage it. I don't know how to do this. Think about what your students want. Think about what your participants want, okay? All right, I'm gonna keep moving through. So today we're gonna talk about um, ways to engage with hybrid programming, uh, visibility that's made possible uh, more through online digital platforms. Um, and also funding, because at the end of the day, as executive directors, as leaders in your organization, that is always something we are worried about constantly, right? Is where is the money coming from? Um, and so it's definitely a hot topic to discuss. All right, you know what? Actually, I'm gonna go back. So before we do that, um, I'm gonna pause for a second. Um, so anyone that um, that is in the space that currently does virtual programming and live programming, uh, send up a thumbs up or heart if you currently are doing some combination of both. Okay, awesome, awesome, I love that. Um, now I'm gonna ask a different question. How many of you um, find it difficult to sustain both of them? Uh, you could throw a thumbs up if you find it difficult. Okay, yeah, right? Um, it's a lot, 
it's a lot to sustain both of those spaces, right? Um, how many people um, have found that it's difficult to garner engagement um, online because you feel like you don't have a following? Okay. So we're going to talk about some of that too, right? Of what it takes, um, how following works, how liking something works, how directing people to a platform works, works, all those kind of things, okay? All right, so I'm going to keep moving forward. Um, like I said, if you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to drop it in the chat. All right, so hybrid programming. Um, your future programming should not have to choose between in-person or online programming. The and is more valuable than, your, than the or. Um, so I want to pause and say that right now, um, there is a but ton. I don't even know. How do you sign but ton? Um, <laughs> um, nice. Nice. Um, so there is a butt ton of money uh, being put forth towards hybrid programming in very unlikely places, right? So the USDA, which is the United States Department of Agriculture, which we don't think about in learning often, um, has offered $42 billion. Yeah, no, 42 million. Sorry, not a B and M. $42 million to rural areas uh, to improve education and healthcare. And you may be thinking, well, why is the USDA doing anything for education? Well, they recognize that during the pandemic, right, some of the inequities that were happening that were intersectional to, um, you know, death or non-vaccinated or things like that were connected to lack of healthcare, lack of education, right? And so they started thinking about ways of beyond just being um, insured with agriculture in rural areas and metropolitan areas, some places. Um, how do we better the whole shebang? So uh, in February of 2021, uh, they signed a bill where they'll be giving $42 million uh, towards education. And the reason um, they're doing this is because they specifically want to donate towards online programming, being able to give those areas access, being able to soup up the technology, whether that's um, offering free Wi-Fi in the areas, whether that's actual computers, whether that's equipment, whether that's actual programming, right? And so you need to remember as you're kind of moving forward that there's all of these unlikely places that are giving funds towards this. Now, with that said, right, there is plenty of ways that we can do this, and we've seen this throughout the pandemic as well, um, of partnering with local theaters. Um, I'll show you some examples in the next few slides of what that may look like. Doing virtual book releases, right, for your students that are having it. Um, of course, slam and short content. Short content is a big deal. So when you're thinking about programming moving forward, sometimes it's not always this big online show or this big online festival. Sometimes it's also teaching your students, right, how and which to engage with an audience in this current era. And in this current era, short content is one of the most sought after things possible for entertainers of all kinds, right? Um, and so we also have open mics, which you have seen done on Zoom, on Instagram, on TikTok, on all of the platforms. Um, there's also short films, right, that are happening where students can take and make right from their phone. I'll show you an example of that as well. Panel discussions are really big. Um, being able to um, collaborate with artists that typically you may not have been able to afford before uh, because you couldn't do flight, hotel, all these things. Now in a, dirt, a virtual space, um, you're able to kind of maneuver a little bit more with what you can do with really amazing thought partners. Um, animation is another big one, partnering with local colleges, uh, some which your participants may actually be attending in their animation department to sun fuse those mediums together. Um, doing talking circles is really cool. And of course, workshops and festivals, right? But we're gonna talk a lot about partnerships because what the online medium does is allow for partnerships that can also transfer to in-person. Y'all still with me? If y'all still with me, 
throw up some hearts so I feel like I'm not talking to myself. I hope you're still there. All right, awesome. I love it. Y'all following me? Y'all need me to slow down for anything? Are y'all good? Drop in the chat if you're good. If you're Okay, perfect. All right. All right, so use what you got, right? Um, your best resources are right in front of you and they are your youth, right? Um, if you are from my era, I am 38 years old. I am an 80s kid. Um, we happen to be right in the middle where we remember life before the internet um, and we remember life after the internet, right? Um, so some things we're a little bit more hesitant to jump on uh, than your youth currently are that were raised with this technology. So they know what's happening. They know what's trending. They know what's going on. Um, and so I've told many people and what we did even at Say Word was having our alumni or even some of our youth creating those teams of social media. Um, instead of having to hire someone um, out externally, we used what was internal. So at the beginning of the pandemic, um, on our Say Word Instagram page, I had two alumni running a youth open mic on Instagram. Um, and my job was just to prepare them for professionalism still in the space, right? Appropriate language in the space, but also things like how to handle trolls, right? How to handle how to market um, in that space. So I still on the back end was doing some mentoring, but the space was theirs, right? To curate, to make, to use the language that they want. Um, and that made them feel more involved even when we were separated. And the beautiful thing about that is this is something that can also happen when you go back to live open mics or live performances to have that curator in the back that's still promoting themselves and still narrating the events of what's happening. So it doesn't just feel like people are just tapping in like a fly on the wall to watch what's happening, but that they're a part of the show. Oftentimes the least engagement is people feeling like they're not at the show. Um, and social media host, um, or if you're doing YouTube Live, or if you're streaming these things, just providing someone there as a host um, in between the performances. So if there's a host on stage, someone to show up almost like how you see any sporting events where there's, you know, the the panel that's speaking in the live, but you always have that that narrator, right? That moderator that's speaking directly into the TV. Doing those same kind of things helps engagement dramatically, all right? Um, but being able to ask them, what's going on right now? What do you use the most right now? Where are you at? How do I find others like you, right? Um, to make sure that they're having access to the brilliant programming that we're offering. Um, growth resources and partnerships, right? So partnerships is going to be the key word. Um, so these are two examples of theater that happened um, during the pandemic, right? So uh, Jamon Hill uh, partnered with the DJ D, D Theater uh, during the pandemic. Um, and as you see in the background of this photograph, his dancers are, are wearing masks and are practicing safety. Um, but that partnership with the theater was really epic because it allowed him as the artist, and he also runs an organization called Flourish, um, the artist and the participants in Flourish to be able to captivate something um, that almost appeared as a film, even though it was still theater. And with the partnership of the theater, it allowed the grant funding, right, to be able to create the project, right? And we're always thinking about that funding. And right now, theater companies across the world are partnering with artists um, because they've all created, at least the larger theaters and some local theaters, um, a streaming live platform. They saw the importance, they saw the relevance, they saw how art can carry beyond just who can buy a ticket and sit in the seats. Um, and are able to sell tickets to these theaters, which give you a partnership, which gives you even wider spread visibility, right? Javon Johnson um, also partnered with the Pasadena Playhouse during the pandemic uh, for a show called Still. Same thing, uh, Pasadena Playhouse was looking for content uh, to be able to stream um, as well as, you know, when the pan, you know, the world opens back up, something they can run as a show. Um, and so this is something to think about. So I'm going to pause there for a second. Um, anyone in here have relationships with their local theater companies? If so, you can drop it in the chat. 
Yes, no, maybe so. If you do not, I highly recommend Google is the thing. Um, Google the local theater companies in your neighborhood. Um, Google foundations that have theater programming um, because poetry is really big right now um, for many reasons, right? I was a full-time poet, um, touring poet for 10 years and I have never seen uh, poetry as large as it is now with the breakthrough of so many different um, people that have broke into mainstream. And so theater is looking for this. They're looking for eyes on them as well. So anytime that you're doing a partnership with them, it's not only benefiting them, it's benefiting you to get those eyes on you as well, right? Um, so I'm gonna keep going. Oops, what is that? Give me one second. You guys still with me? I hope so. It's so weird just talking into nothing. <laughs> We've been able to build an amazing relationship with Des Moines Performing Arts. They even offer us record poems for the slam in their space. So thankful for it. Yes. And so, Leah, with that, right, not only do you want uh, to re record your items there and then take the recordings and drop it somewhere else, but make sure in these partnerships you're also asking, is this a show or a program that you would like to have on your channel? right or do you currently have a live stream what does that look like um, because that cross marketing and cross promoting um, is really helpful and goes bigger than oh a, a nice space to record right a nice space to record is cool um, but you always want to think about not just the tangible resources like a stage lighting this is and that but you want to think about the visibility benefits right so hey you are letting us record this here. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, do you have a live stream network for the theater? Is this a program that you would like to run or archive for people to do that we can send our people to click the link over there? And a couple things are going to happen. One, most likely you're going to get better quality because they're not going to put anything on their site that doesn't represent them well. Two, you're able to then lead people over to a credible, large, theater company that is um, hosting your work, right? Which also draws more attention when it comes to funding, things like that. So always think about the duality of, you know, yes, it's a give and get, but it's also about all the things that um, are not the tangible product, right? Um, but I'm so glad to hear that. All right, so um, this is a, a piece, and the reason I bring this up, so um, I was doing uh, virtual programming, like many people, um, over the um, over the last school year during the pandemic. And uh, we were teaching a course um, that I constructed, that I wrote the curriculum for, that actually drew in the idea of influencers. And as a poet, how we influence. So we talked about major influences on YouTube, on um, Instagram, on TikTok, um, and broke down their strategies and techniques and, and things like that of what they did and how they got there. And so at the culminating event for this class, um, students were allowed to present a poem in numerous ways that were reflections of their favorite influencers. So that means they could film a video, that means that they could um, do a collaboration partnership of going live and hosting a space. They could um, utilize sound, right? Do something on SoundCloud, right? Um, they could do animation, um, and we showed them different forms of animation, how to create that. The list goes on. And so I selected this video for you guys to watch um, because this was one of our most introverted, quiet, non-participating students um, in the class prior to me getting there. And uh, when the release was taken off of her that she didn't have to be on camera, but could artistically match her words to what it is that she saw in the world, um, she really flourished. And this was something uh, that ended up being used, um, right, 
after the class was done to other campuses to say, hey, this is a part of what the programming looks like of what students are creating and generated, right, more classes for us at a time when a lot of people were saying they didn't have money, right? Uh, but they were struggling, right, to get students to engage, to participate, uh, to chime in in class, to turn their cameras on, right, the whole thing. And so teachers are hungry right now to figure out different ways that students can do um, can express themselves, can still be interactive, um, and you have the ways of doing that, being that you already teach a form of self-expression, right? You already teach poetry, you already teach written word, um, and now it's just lending itself to the technology and then having that documentation, which is beautiful about technology, to really push for more contracts, more this. So I'm gonna play this for you. Again, she was, uh, one of our most introverted students, so she is a little soft-spoken, um, but I think it's beautiful what she was able to create. Hold on, let me see if I can refresh. Give me one second. We shine luminously before their very eyes, so they don't become afraid of the dark. Tides in the water wave to us excitingly. Are we the symbol of peace? We allow people to collect themselves. We guide people to sleep and dream. But Luna, we are slowly drifting away from Earth the very place where women give birth. We are much smaller than soul, but they still see our light. The imperfections marked on our bodies from afar, but our lights can shine many stars, but the craters have left many scars. Are we a work of art? One that belongs in a museum? Or one that hangs on a wall, are we as beautiful as soul? Soul, you guide people with wake and possibilities. Your shine is much different than mine. In fact, you shine so brightly that the trees grow pleasantly. The tides wave to me, but they warm up to the sight of you. You are warm, your touch is warm, still warm from 17 years ago when you introduced me to earth. People look at you and notice your impact. You punch them with energy, but you tell me never to punch unless need be. You inspire me. You believe in me. However, there are things to note. My light is not like yours, and that is okay. It is challenging to say simple things, but they always say actions speak louder than words. Our bonding moments are recorded in my mind, kind of like how everything in space is recorded online. So, I am still figuring myself out. I enjoy routine and simplicity. You tell me to gravitate towards complexity. We are not the same, but you keep me going. I keep you collected. Mama, you are my sunshine. I am your moonlight and together 
We do just fine. I know you are scared, Mama. But I will be fine. Mama, I will be just fine. Let me use your light and you will see. I love you. Oh, right. I know that was very soft-spoken where we all have those students. How many people have those students that don't say a word and then to themselves? Yeah, yeah, we all do, right? Um, but these are absolutely beautiful ways that portray that. And when it comes to hybrid programming, these are things that get shown, right, before a show starts, right, or at the end of a show or in between during transitions, if you're putting on poetry plays, things like that, um, that you can still utilize this. And so I just want to keep giving you guys ideas of, you know, how in which we're moving, right, these things together. These are things that are beautiful um, to, right, educational boards that may necessarily go, yeah, that's great that you have kids that are rah, rah, rah on stage, but I don't have those kids. So what do the kids that I have do, right? Um, and for me, this is always a great way with Say Word to go, I got you. Even if your kid isn't rah, rah, right? Even if your kid isn't outspoken, right? Um, there's beautiful ways in which they can still express themselves. Y'all hear me? Y'all with me? Yes? Um, so I'm going to pause for a second. Um, is it possible right now to go to the um, little green box one? Is that possible? And then come back to the slideshow. Rachel. Rachel is our tech um, and also Trish over here is killing it, yes. Um, so if you wanna come up and ask a question with anything right now and have me pause for a second, feel free uh, to click. I like to see faces, because right now I sp feel like I'm speaking into a void, um, and it's <laughs> a little daunting uh, to not be able to see and hear folks. So um, if you wanna come up and just converse and tell me about you know, what online programming you have, um, what you're currently doing, how you're thinking about moving forward um, in meshing the programs together, um, go ahead and click any of these little green boxes um, and you can come up and uh, let me know. If not, then I will continue on with the presentation, but I would love to see your faces. So Nicole and Leah and Joel, if you are in here, you're mainly who I see over here in the chat, uh, feel free to click a box. I would love to put a face to the name. I'll give a few seconds. If not, then we'll keep it keep it moving. Lanita, I see you are in here. Bergs, um, Jenny, um, I also see Dorian Vasquez. Um, so if any of you guys have anything, nope. All right, well, all right, y'all gonna leave me up here by my lonesome. All right. Well, I'll keep it moving since y'all going to leave me up here with by my lonesome. All right. Uh, I got the kiddos in the same room listening to the panel, but happy to drop in the chat. Yes, I know. Um, funny story is I'm competing against a panel that I put together, <laughs> which I know is lit right now. So um, I totally get it. Um, so, all right. So um, moving forward. Consistency is key. It is time for story time, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when we talk about following, some of you guys said definitely that, um, you know, you're finding it difficult to get that following, to get um, the people to actually do those likes, actually come forward. And you've probably been told all the stories of, you got to get your following up. If without that, you're not doing much. By raise of hands, hearts, or thumbs up, how many people are struggling with getting a following on any of these platforms? Anybody in here struggling with that? Um, that you, you know, are so close and you want to reach like 100K, but you may only be at like 500 or 2,000 or something like that, which in, you know, uh, yeah right um that's definitely something and so um i'm going to tell you the story of myself um when pre-pandemic um i was not a social media person at all um i maybe had 500 followers um that i posted every once in a while um i wasn't super engaged i didn't know what to post i was like i don't understand this world or this language 
Um, how do I get there, right? Um, and then when the pandemic happened, um, I watched so many of my community members. Um, I'm gonna pause, sorry, I also have a lot of my background. We have been on virtual since October and doing virtual open mics. We are featured. We just started working on our arts council and hope to have a vibrant slam. Perfect. I love that. Um, so yeah, so um, I just didn't know what to do. But during the pandemic, I watched so many of my community members um, losing jobs, right? That at the end of the day, so was I, right? Uh, losing money, losing gigs, not knowing how they were going to survive, not knowing how they were going to pull through. And so um, I don't have a lot of money, but I was like, whatever I can collect in donations, I know I have a giving community that does show up, right? Even if it's $5 donors, $1 donors, $20 donors, right? My small donorship pocket, um, I know they'll give. And maybe I can give a couple hundred bucks to some poets in LA, help them get through, buy groceries, something. Um, and from that, um, I started one of the first Instagram slams uh, to be in existence that's fully on Instagram, which was Screen Time Slam. Um, now we've become pretty large uh, all over the country and even had some international poets slamming with us. Um, but a couple things um, of how it started, right? Resources, we talk about, I don't have all the resources. I don't have all the fancy cameras. I don't have all the, all the stuff all the engineering stuff, all the technical stuff. Um, I started Screen Time Slam with a ring light, a phone, and a big personality right out of my kitchen, right? We were locked in. It was right out of my kitchen. And this will be relevant later. Um, but what I did was understand that hosting an event online is not much different than hosting an event live. And this is where a lot of people I see mess up right they get online they're sitting in a chair they're just kind of lackadaisical and being like yeah here's the performer um and so what i did differently than a lot of other people did was i treated the slam just as i would treat a live audience super hype energy making sure to acknowledge people making sure to acknowledge the donors making sure i had an amazing playlist and more than that, right, making sure that people knew how to be involved, right? Um, now, I kept doing it because consistency is key. The first show we ever had, I think, maybe had 15 viewers, right? That was nothing, right? Um, I had maybe 500 followers, 15 viewers. It was nothing. But I was doing it every single Sunday and still do it every single Sunday and slowly began to see people becoming more engaged that were non-poets, that were poets, that were onlookers trying to figure out what this was, what the culture of it was because a lot of times we forget to attract the people that know nothing about our culture, right? And to bring them in. And so slowly I started to see that happen. And in just one year's time, I went from 500 to 3,100, right? So I looked at, you know, over a 2,500 increase in following, really because of screen time, right? Um, in that process, I also made sure to make a website. Now, it wasn't just a website to show information and how to donate, but I made sure it was interactive, meaning every poet that participated in screen time had a photograph in like a rolling situation on the website that you could click and it would take you directly to their Instagram. So when we talk about visibility, right, we're also talking about reciprocity, right? The more people can visit the poets that come on to mine and see how amazing they are, the more they're willing to continue to come back and find new faces, find new voices. So it works for both the artists, right, and for you guys, the youth artists, as it does for the organization or the platform, right? The third thing I did was make sure to keep in contact, right? Many of you guys, if you haven't heard, should know that your email list is a golden ticket, right? When it comes to the virtual world. If you are not utilizing consistently your email list, right? It is going to waste. And the way that I did that was every person that signed up for Screen Time Slam, every person that judges for Screen Time Slam, every person that's about manager for Screen Time Slam, 
when they do their registration and mind you it was free to register um they had to give me their email right and so i started building this list that now is you know four to five hundred people on an email list that started from zero a year ago right and consistently sending out newsletters not only about um what screen time was or what activities were coming up but what our mission was what we wanted to do what our dreaming was um, and how they can engage with that right how they can subscribe to these things and so it's really important when it comes to building up a platform and the more people that got these emails the more were forwarded the more were sent out the more people I found following the more people were telling me testimonies things like that right um, and over a year's time we've been able to attract all of these sponsors right just from running screen time um, I didn't seek out any of these sponsors uh, they just saw the consistency they saw what we were doing they saw that we continue to bring joy based work into a space that was needed um, and I had some skepticism once the world started opening back up of whether or not it would uh, continue um, and I'm happy to say that we went from 15 viewers our first slam on Instagram um, all the way up to a hundred viewers now I'm gonna put this in um, a spectrum for you if I only have 3100 followers and I'm getting a hundred views the statistics of that is actually higher engagement than most people that have 10,000 followers and are only getting 200 viewers so your engagement counts too when you're thinking of approaching um, sponsors and things like that not just your followers right so let's say you have a following of 700 but when you go live or when you put up a post in the amount of likes or whatever that may be you're getting a large majority you're getting at least 10 percent um, or 15 percent of people engaged people love that and that's also called micro influencing and right now people are seeking micro influencers all over the place and your organization not just an individual can also be a micro influencer that can assist so one of our sponsors was the body is not an apology which was created by Sonia Renee one of the most world-renowned poets uh, that our community has um, then we have stage might which Seku Andrew runs so if you're watching the panel on the other one Seku was also one of ours we started with poets at the core we started with big name poets we started with our internal community um, and doing tiers right you could donate a hundred dollars you could donate two thousand dollars you could donate five hundred dollars whatever it was but we started with ourselves right a pouring back into ourselves um, then we got Heart Saver Atlanta, uh, which was a CPR company, which is super weird because they have nothing to do with poetry. Um, but they were looking for a particular demographic. And if you look at your insights on any of your programs, we fulfilled that demographic. They saw the people that they wanted to reach showing up in our spaces. And so they were like, hey, how can we partner with you, right? And then we had big names like Matthew Lillard. If you do not recognize the name, he is the voice of Scooby-Doo um, and also played Shaggy in Scooby-Doo. Uh, he also is currently in an NBC show called Good Girls. Um, and so he came through and wanted to definitely do that. And at our BNV time screen time youth slam last year, he was one of the judges and came on and blessed the kids. Um, also Catlett Academy, which is ran by Will Catlett, uh, who is another big name uh, actor who started as a poet actually um, and so that's the thing too you don't know who's starting as this um, he's played in plenty of movies and shows so please look up Will Catlett uh, the social good club which is just what it's called right it's a club that really identifies different organizations that are just trying to do good work to bring communities together they're really about finding intersectionality and what that is um, Silky Ganache uh, who is from RuPaul's Drag Race um, who um, I actually was blessed to know when they were going to Wabash University and doing poetry right all of these people that you would not expect uh, to be that were seeing what was happening online and not directly through me because I'll be honest I'm a nobody right um, but other people sending them you never know who's watching 
Um, and then with our words, which was a BMV alumni organization who has sponsored the last two seasons. And what a sponsorship meant to us was not just them giving us money to have prize money and things like that, but was really figuring out what causes um, what they needed, right? So a lot of my questioning to my sponsors is, what do you need right now? Who are you trying to attract right now? How do we tie in whatever happens at screen time with what you're currently doing, right? So for example, um, when we partnered with Seku Andrews and Stage Mites, he was currently at that time promoting his speaker training and wanted to get more young, um, active people into learning um, how to do speaker uh, speaker training and panels. Um, and so throughout the slam, we were having interviews about the importance of speaking beyond poetry. We were doing things that brought attention to his business so it was worth, right, his investment moving forward, right? Um, with our words, which was a youth organization, of course, out of Stockton, California. Um, one of the things that they wanted was when we had the big name poets come through and compete, will they offer a workshop to the kids, right? And so that's really a, just a lot of like relationship building that's happening, right? They also didn't have a lot of online engagement. So they were looking to attract more people to participate because even though we weren't large in following, we were large in engagement, right? And so this is ways that I say that I never would have partnered with any of these people if it hadn't been for the online platform, right? Now we're moving into spaces where it's happening in li live and, and things like that. Um, but now that the world is opening, opening up, um, we are still getting 60, 75, right? A hundred viewers um, and they haven't gone anywhere. So people are still craving, right? This kind of interaction, this kind of engagement um, online, just as they might, just as much as they are continuing to go back into live. Y'all with me? Y'all good with me? Y'all have any questions about sponsorships, how to gain them, how to attract them, how to move forward with them? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay. All right. So um, in one year, uh, we've been able to raise without any grants, without any big name companies, $18,000. Um, which seems small, right? Um, what was the name of speaker training for panelists? Uh, that it's, so Seku Andrews runs a speaker training called Stage Might. Stage Might. Um, so yes, yeah, so in a year we were able to raise eighteen thousand dollars, which, like I said, doesn't seem like much. Uh, but in a time when you're in a pandemic and people were not necessarily giving, it was a whole lot to raise um, to be able to assist poets all over. We also have had over 250 poets that are world renowned from Ed Mabry to NQ to Talame C. Um, Sekou uh, was on there. Sonia was on there, like I said. Um, Shehan Van Cleef, Javon Johnson. Um, the list goes on. Lady Breon, right? All of the champions that your kids are looking up to um, have been through screen time, right? Have seen that. And one of the other things that was really dope about screen time was um, after these people competed, they came back, right? And offering them roles of what can we do next? Okay, maybe you can judge. Maybe you can um, lead workshops with this. Maybe you can do this. Because once you get the people to believe in the vision and how that can expand, right? You can do that. But I wanna remind you guys that this started with me thinking I could give $200 to somebody in LA with 15 viewers and 500 followers, right? And in one year's time has right quadrupled what that looks like because consistency is key. Treating your online audience just as you would your live audience is key. Um, and being able to figure out how that emergence comes through. Um, so just that little story of hope for y'all. Um, and this is my last slide because I know we are wrapping up. Um, but just think of the benefits, right? It broadens your student access, right? Those who um, have disabilities, right, are differently abled. Um, those who also have uh, mental and emotional, right, are, are, are um, disabled in that way where they have anxiety about live, they have, um, some people have PTSD of not leaving the home. This gives them access to still be able to participate. Uh, Student-led programming, this is their world. They know this joint, right? They know it here. Um, so letting them take the lead and you kind of guiding them 
uh, through professionalism is really important. Um, attracting sponsorships and new donors, right? You're documenting every time you're going live, every time that you're doing YouTube, every time that you're doing um, any kind of videos recording. That's all documentation that you need to be keeping that you can put into pitch decks, that you can put into reels, that you can put into your marketing, all of that, right? Um, also aiding future campaigns, right? Creating hashtags, um, for campaigns moving forward allows the ability for people to share, to jump into that movement, to go, um, and expanding the terrain of guest and partnership because it's a lot easier for someone to say, hey, I can um, zoom in, give a lecture, give a talk, give a performance, um, and have some of your people there live. Um, so I want to stop there because I know we're we're almost done uh, this because it's, uh, it's one o'clock now. Um, and if any of you guys are not watching kids behind you and the other panel, you have the opportunity to ask any questions um, or any feedback um, that you would like to know. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with you guys and sharing what I've learned and sharing the importance of this. Also remember there's tons of money that is coming through. Like I said, um, the USDA alone um, is offering 42 million uh, to virtual programming. Um, and your school district is also upping the game for sure. Um, on a federal level, they're making sure specifically for hybrid programming and virtual programming, there's um, a big trickle down effect that's going into next year. And that's not just for school districts. That is for partnering organizations, right? And they love to see when um, there's an emergence, right, of, of collaboration, right? So if it's the district, a theater company, and yourself, right, with your organization, that's the kind of stuff they want to see, that they want to fund, that they want to get behind. So I'm going to shut up. If anybody has any questions or feedback or you learned something today, drop it in the chat or you can click one of the boxes. All right, party people. Well, um, fascinating ideas and journeys. Thank you so much. Appreciate you listening. Um, I love it. Um, so with that said, I guess um, I will let you guys go so you can finish watching your kids and uh, getting ready for the rest of the day. Please remember today, uh, stay positive, stay up, uh, watch your kids, but also take care of yourself. Um, and if you have any questions about any of the educational offerings that are happening during this event, please feel free to reach out to me um, since I am your educational coordinator uh, this season, um, this season, this year. I don't know what to say. Um, but yeah, thank you guys.